cool. Go over here. Okay, so today's focus is gonna be on micro and local scale climate processes. And so we're gonna go over electromagnetic ra radiation, albedo, wind, a little bit of precipitation and the design considerations for microclimate. So this diagram on the right here is a figure of, we've got the distance scale on the bottom axis and temporal scale on the vertical axis. In here is where we're gonna be focusing. So we're gonna be focusing on areas less than a kilometer and processes that are in the temporal scale of about a day. And our learning adventure begins at the sun. So 150 million kilometers away, the sun is losing about 4.2 million tons per second when four hydrogen atoms fuse into a helium atom. And in that process, a photon is released. This photon, it travels in a wave and this makes up the electromagnetic spectrum, which is displayed right here. And it's important to think of the electromagnetic spectrum and the wave in which that photon travels as a pulse of energy. So on the right over here where the mouse is, these are longer wavelengths then radio waves to infrared to the visible light, which is the, um, the wavelength, the wavelength, the spectrum of wavelengths that our sun emits the most out of. And then moving into ultraviolet and x-rays and gamma rays. And the further to the left we go, the more intense that radiation is, the more energy that's in that radiation. And it helps to think that this wave as a pulse. So imagine if you were in a boxing ring and you're getting punched every time the boxer hit at this peak right here, you're gonna get a lot more hits in the face per unit time over here with these gamma rays than if you're over here. Luckily for us, our atmosphere does a really, really good job of filtering out those really intense radiation waves. So what we're left with is a little bit of ultraviolet, visible and infrared. And then that gets converted into heat when it hits a surface on the planet. So going forth, we are going to be talking about shortwave radiation and longwave radiation. Shortwave radiation is that ultraviolet part of the spectrum that we can't see at all, but it's interacting with surfaces. And then when that happens, so photon of a, ultraviolet radiation will come down, hit something, cause a molecule or a compound or anything to, to vibrate and gives off kinetic energy. It induces vibrations, that matter will start moving, it'll start vibrating at a more readily faster rate and it'll give off long wave thermal radiation. And this is the stuff that we are really particularly interested in because this is what we are trying to either um, get rid of or get more of. And so when the, yeah, as the shortwave radiation reaches the surface of the earth, it's inevitably going to come into contact with some sort of medium. And depending on the reflectivity of that medium, which is the albedo of it, which we'll get into later, that shortwave radiation is either going to be reflected or it's going to be absorbed. If reflected, which is going to happen if you have a surface with a higher albedo, that shortwave radiation is going to go back into space, or it's gonna hit another medium where again, it's either absorbed or reflected. Now, if it's absorbed, an instance where more likely with surfaces with a low albedo, that shortwave radiation will induce kinetic movement as I was talking about, and lead to the emission of relatively speaking, lower energy radiation. And that is the thermal long wave radiation. And that's what we feel as heat energy. So albedo is the reflectivity of a medium. And it's a ratio scale. So it's usually communicated as either zero to one or 100% or 0%. So a perfect reflector has reflects 100%. It has a really high albedo. So that'd have an albedo number of one if it reflects literally all light that comes to it. So there's not much that a mirror would be a good example of that. And the darker something is, the lower the albedo it has so the more it's going to absorb because the less it's going to reflect back into another direction and you would have experienced this if you're wearing a black t-shirt or a hoodie on a really sunny day you're going to get a lot warmer because that black 
t-shirt is going to absorb more of that solar radiation, convert it into th thermal heat, and you're going to get warm and sweaty, and it's not going to be that fantastic. So there's also some considerations we need to take into effect when we're considering the sun and where all of that solar radiation is coming from. So in the northern hemisphere, we'll have at solar noon, the sun will be right up top at the zenith. But as the year progresses and when we're coming into winter now, that solar arc is going to be a, a lot lower in the sky. And we need to consider that into our designs. Furthermore, when it's more directly above us, like say you had a flashlight and you were shining it right down, that light beam is going to be more concentrated on that surface relative to if it was coming in on an angle. So you can see right here at a 60 degree angle, we're getting 50 <coughs> less radiation per unit area relative to when it's directly above. And that is going to actually come in handy. It's not really a bad thing. And when we're considering this exchange between short wave and long wave radiation, it really comes down to these two things. So this might look a little bit complex, but I promise it's not. K right here is short wave radiation. So this is the stuff coming from the sun. And also I'll note, this is the day. So this is what's happening during the day. Sunlight is coming down. It has a couple options. It's either gonna be reflected, which is denoted with K up right here, or it's gonna get absorbed and turned into long wave down and in some instances, we're going to have thermal radiation being reflected back down as well. And what we're particularly interested in is the partitioning of where that energy is going. So we've got a couple options here where it's either going to be conducted into the ground, be converted into sensible heat, or it's going to go into evaporation. And we can all agree that when we apply sufficient heat to ice, that's going to melt. And when we apply sufficient heat to water, that it's going to boil. We can also agree that when we draw enough heat out of the water, it's going to turn into ice. And when we draw, or when a certain temperature is reached and an air mass can no longer hold its water, it condenses. But there's a lot going on behind the scenes here that are really important to consider. First being is that there is a, there's latent heat. So latent means hidden heat um, in Latin. And so when we have ice and we're gonna turn it into water, there's a little plateau right here where that water, it's not gonna actually increase in temperature at all until all of that ice is melted and that energy is getting stored in the water. Similarly, when we have water and we boil it, that water is gonna to get to hundred degrees Celsius, assuming you're at sea level and then turn into steam, but it's gonna stay at hundred degrees Celsius. It's not gonna get hotter than that at sea level. Similar thing happens, well, not similar thing, but so energy is being drawn in and it stays there. But when it goes from steam to water, that energy gets released as heat. And it's pretty counterintuitive, but in protecting your plants from frost, and I know this is true in New Zealand, a lot of vineyards will put sprinklers out when there's a frost warning and that water will go onto the buds, it'll freeze, and as doing so, it will release heat. So you're using ice to make sure that you don't get frost, which is crazy, but it's it works. So general rule of thumb here is when you're going from ice to liquid or liquid to gas, heat's getting sucked up. And when the reverse happens, so when you're going from gas to liquid or liquid to ice, heat is being released. And if that went over your head, that's totally chill. Um, the most important things to remember is the sun's a giant nuclear reactor that emits radiation. The gnarly stuff gets filtered out by our atmosphere and what's left is some ultraviolet, visible and infrared. And depending on the superficial characteristics or the most importantly, the albedo of that medium that that light hits, it's either gonna be absorbed and be re-radiated as heat or used for evaporation, or it's gonna get reflected into space. If that energy goes towards evaporation or a phase change, just remember that when ice goes to water or water goes to gas, so an in increase in the phase change, heat's going to get sucked up. And when you go from water to ice or gas to water, heat is going to be released. 
So when it comes to microclimates, what we're trying to do is exclude, include, enhance, or degrade the solar energy input. And I know Rob would have talked about in his previous videos, and I know because I watched um, about how everything has the right to garden and everything does garden. And so what we are doing is gardening sunlight. We are using that and we're gonna we're gonna channel it into into food or livestock systems or our built environments or energy systems or aquatic systems. And through thinking about this a lot, I've come up with three base principles that we need to consider when we're designing. And so the first is that cold air is more dense than warm air because it's, it's heavier. It has more mass. Warm air masses can hold more water vapor than cold air masses. So if we imagine air as just weight lifting and it's being strengthened by temperature. So if we have two uniform air masses that have the exact same amount of water vapor in them and we cool this one, it's gonna not be able to hold that water and it's gonna condense out. If we warm this one that has the exact same amount of water that that other one had, the water content is going to stay the same, but it's going to get relatively drier because it can hold more. It could still, if you input more water into there, it could take more on the cold one. You couldn't at all. And so that's why relative humidity is a function of temperature. And we're going to go through a little thought, process, thought problem in a little bit to go over that. The second thing you need to consider when designing for microclimate are the zeroth, first, and second laws of thermodynamics. So the zeroth law is that if Let's say we have A and we have B and we have C. If the temperature of A equals B and the temperature of C equals B, then, the then ipso facto the temperature of A equals C and that system is in thermal equilibrium. The first law of thermodynamics states that no energy can be created or destroyed and only transferred. And the second law is essentially is that nothing is 100% efficient. And how um, the first law of thermodynamics, so energy can't be created or destroyed, plays out is because it can't be created or destroyed and has to be transferred, it does so through conduction, convection, and radiation. And conduction is, if I were to heat this side, those molecules would vibrate. And as a cascading chain, more molecules would vibrate here and that heat would get transferred. Convection, on the other hand, is if I've got some shortwave radiation coming down here and it hits right here, that air is gonna be less dense than its surroundings because it's doing work. It's taking up less or more space for the same amount of mass within it. It's gonna rise. We all know that hot air rises and that's why. Third is radiation, which is, we're not gonna to get too into, that's where we're getting our energy from, from the sun and it goes through vacuums. And that's important for evacuated tubes and solar heating of water. And we'll get into that. And the third and most important one is that the world is always striving for a state of equilibrium. And it'll never get there um, because there's just way too many inputs. And, um, and I'm here and I'm, I like to have fun. So the world's never gonna be boring. Um, but this applies to all time scales and spatial scales and a lot of equilibriums are dynamic. So they're changing relative to those changing inputs. And that's especially true with landforms. Um, and when this equilibrium is strived for, it always goes from high to low. And they, these systems will respond all on their own accordingly to a, a different shift in inputs and some general rules of thumb for this are that the greater the difference between the two, the faster the flow, and the shorter the distance between those two mediums, the faster the flow. And the best way to, to like, the best thing to liken this to is if, um, if you live anywhere where there's snow and you go tobogganing, if the hill is really steep, so if your elevation change is really that that gradient is really high. So 60 meters, it's gonna be, you're gonna go down that hill a lot faster relative to if it was only five meters. 
Similarly, the shorter that distance between the two, the steeper that gradient's gonna be, so the faster that flow is gonna go. And when it comes to microclimates, this applies to heat, pressure, humidity. So things will always go from areas of high heat to low heat. What makes our wind is a differential pressure, largely by which it is driven by heat, and it'll go from high pressure to low pressure. Similarly, with humidity, things go from areas of high water vapor to low water vapor. And the question we need to be asking ourselves moving forward is when we are designing is how can I best use energy before it passes from my site or system? Well, you might want to get rid of it. You might want to keep it. You might want to do all sorts of things to it. So when it comes to density, we all know that um, if you put oil on water, the oil is going to sit on top because it's less dense. And so this diagram right here is just a, going over basic density things and you can get layers and the atmosphere is the same. When the conditions are right and there isn't a lot of mixing going on from a, induced by global um, circulation patterns, then cold air is actually going to sink because it's more dense and then when it does sink and it's cold enough, it's not going to be able to hold that water any longer and it's going to condense out. So right here, you can see there's an inversion right here. So right here, where these clouds are, that marks the temperature by which that air mass can no longer hold that water. And it goes, oh, I can't, just can't hold it on longer. I'm just got to let it out and condense it. And then it turns into cloud. And here's some, some thought experiments regarding relative humidity. So remember that relative humidity is a function of temperature. So especially where I live right now, we're getting a lot of this. I mean, not so much because there's usually only one person in a car, which is a shame, but it's just the way the news goes right now. But say you just went hiking in the mountains and you're with three or four mates and you get back into your car, you've been gone for five hours or so, you get back in your car and then all of a sudden your windows start fogging up. And why is that happening? Well, that's happening because your windows are acting as the buffer between you and the outside environment. And right now where I am, it's cold. So that window is gonna be cold, but you've got five humans just respirating water vapor out, emitting heat, but as soon as it, that air hits that window, it's going to condense because it gets colder. So how are we going to fix that? The best way to fix that is to heat up the car itself with the, um, with the heater. But you can also use the air conditioning, which effectively dries out the air that's being pumped into your innards of your car. And that's going to increase the, the pressure gradient, the vapor pressure gradient. So water vapor or the water that's condensed on to your windows is going, is going to be able to evaporate because there's actually room for it to evaporate. And also where I'm living right now, and a lot of people in Canada can relate, is in the wintertime in the inside of our houses, we get terrible dry skin. And this is what happens when you have a furnace that's drying in cold air that has a relative humidity of maybe 85%. Remember, it can't hold that much water because it's cold. But as soon as you bring it in and heat it up, that relative humidity is going to plummet. So it's going to go down because all of a sudden it's warmer. It can hold more water. So my skin is just going to dry out because there's so little moisture in the air relative to when it's outside. It has the same amount of water vapor inside of it. OK. So that covers the first one. We've gone over this already. Um, so if A equals C and B equals C, then A equals B, that's equilibrium. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. And entropy is always increasing or nothing is 100% efficient. And we need to appreciate that nothing is 100% efficient, but we also need to organize that entropy to do our work. And to do so, we're going to channel it. And I find, I find a lot of um, links between Star Wars and the Force and permaculture, a bit of a nerd, but um, 
form, what we see is the manifestation of a system balancing its inputs and outputs through a flux in energy and mass through the mechanism of process. And the form that we want to see is a thriving ecosystem where we can just go outside and get some food. So that's what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. So this is what we're gonna talk about in the PDC itself. And we're gonna go over all this, we're, especially the broad climate patterns, that's, that's my bread and butter. Um, but right now we are just gonna be focusing on the microclimate. And so what is a microclimate? A microclimate is an area that has a markedly distinct climate relative to its surroundings. And it can be anywhere between a couple meters squared to kilometer squared. And some very important determining factors in setting up a microclimate are your solar aspect and your solar resources available, the topography and the slopes, the soils, water bodies, built structures, vegetation and animals, and wind. And just to demonstrate the power of microclimate, um, these are Incan terraces, and these are located at three and a half kilometers above sea level. They've been engineered so that they never flood. There's a 15 degrees Celsius difference between the highest and lowest terrace, with the warmest being at the bottom. And they've developed 3,000 types of potatoes. And the pollen samples done here indicate that a huge variety of crops were grown here. And it's no surprise that 60% of the world's food crop originated in the Andes. A lot of thanks to these Incan engineers. So we're gonna go through these determining factors one by one. Aspect is the first. So aspect is the direction that a hill faces. And this diagram right here is a Northern hemisphere example. As you may suspect, Southern aspects, because the sun is on average hitting the equator with the most intensity there, that south facing slopes are going to have, they're gonna be more exposed to that radiation. So they're gonna be warm and which isn't always a good thing because they could overheat, but it is, it is um, the optimal place to be orienting your plants, especially if they love heat. And on the other side of the hill, you'd expect there'd be less radiation. So it's gonna be cooler, it's gonna be moister, and um, there's gonna be a later, frost is gonna happen for longer in the year there and it's gonna start bef before it does on the south side. And this is why, right here. So right here, it's more direct on this south facing slope. And over here, it becomes diluted because it's being spread over a wider area and it's the same net amount of light coming in. And this gets manifested and you can see this in really predominantly in some areas. So why are the pine trees thriving on this north facing slope? Well, it's because the evaporation there isn't as, a, isn't as predominant. So it, less water is leaving that side of the slope. So those trees can suck up all that water and thrive more readily. And this is a, this is an output actually from the contour map generator that we are working on. Uh, it's going to be available very shortly. Um, but I just want to go over it. It's, you know, the having a south facing aspect isn't always the best and you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Like we need to have resilience. And so if I were to say I was a, a grape, I was growing grapes for wine. And I thought it'd be a great idea to just plant all of my vines on a south facing slope. And turns out it was a really mild spring and I had a very early budding. What happens if there's a late frost and then all those buds die? They just get dried out and they die. That would be quite silly and you want to have eggs in more than one basket. So you have on the north facing slope, I would plant some more vines and it, it provides a sort of bio assurance. So if there was a really warm early spring, had some budding, they might bud on the south facing slopes, but they wouldn't bud on the north facing slopes. And then by the time that late spring frost happens, I'm still in the clear for those north facing slopes. So this tool is gonna be available 
uh, pretty shortly. We'll be announcing that and it's going to be very handy. We're very excited about it. The other, another factor is topography. And so 1938, Alfred Wegener, the same guy who hypothesized continental drift was the first one to put this forth. I mean, valley winds and mountain winds were always known, obviously, or else we wouldn't have, uh, these Incan engineers would not be able to do what they were doing. Um, but it's, he was the first one to, to lay down the scientific principles for that. So the amount of solar radiation being input across a valley is constant but there's less volume of air on those valley sides relative to the valley bottom because it's that slope is incising. If it there was a square, the valley would be a triangle right there, full square right here, and then that air right there on that other side of the valley. And because there is less volume of air on those valley sides, there's differential heating and cooling which induces a pressure gradient, which equals wind. And so in the daytime, we can expect that that air is being heated on the sides relative, more relatively to what's happening on the valley floors. And that is gonna, that air is gonna rise on the sides. It's gonna hit a point, it's gonna condense and turn into clouds and it's gonna cycle back in. On the, at the valley head, it's going to draw in air from the plains because hot air rises. It's going to draw that in. At the at nighttime, the opposite happens, whereby the the slopes they they cool at a faster rate than the valley floor, and that cold air sinks down, and that's why valley floors are a lot more prone to frosts. And this diagram shows that quite well and shows the thermal belt. So the thermal belt is this Goldilocks zone where you're having a lot of thermal mixing and nothing's actually getting stratified. So you have a more stable climate relative to your surroundings because you're always having that movement of heat and the cold air is always gonna sink down here and it's gonna stratify on when the conditions facilitate that. So mostly during anti-cyclones and high pressure systems. And I'm gonna get into all of that for the for the big the big PDC when you'll be able to listen to me ramble for six hours, which is gonna be fun. And so this is yeah, the Goldilocks zone, the thermal belt is very key to consider, especially if you have a property on a slope. And there's a lot of other topographical considerations you're going to need to take into your design when you're accounting for where you are and the topography around you. I'm going to go way more into this during the, during the PDC. Um, but just as a case study, so this is actually where my master's thesis was conducted in, in Bannockburn in central Otago in New Zealand. And so you can see here, there's a lot of complex terrain a lot of valleys. So this cold air is going to be sinking down here when conditions permit and it's going to stratify and it doesn't always need to be a frost pocket. So it doesn't always need to be just a depression where cold air can go. It can be a place where there's insufficient draining, drainage of that cold air because remember that air is a fluid much like water and it's going to flow down and it's going to go the path of least resistance, which is why you can feel cool winds going through valley bottoms. And so even on places where it's flat, you don't need a depression, but having insufficient draining will facilitate that frost because that cold air can't move anywhere. Next up is soils and microclimate. So the effect on microclimate with soils is primarily through the water content. So how much energy is actually going to go into the evaporation of the water in that soil and the albedo of that soil itself. And this has implications for plant and fungal communities, which you are want to be obviously want to be healthy as possible. So the things you need to consider are the texture, which um, will dictate how much water can actually stay in your soil, how aggregated it is. So how hard it is for water to infiltrate 
which is the next point as well, and the rock and gravel content. So when I talked about those Incan terraces, it never flooded. And it never flooded because through, I imagine, centuries of practice, they figured that they needed to have sufficient drainage so that they could just get that water, percolate it through the soil, keep it moist enough to do its job, but get it out so it doesn't become anaerobic. And the more water you have in your soil, um, the, the more energy is gonna go into evaporation. And so you wanna have, a, you wanna strike a balance between how much water is going, just enough water to keep your plants healthy and, but not so much that it's gonna be you know, an overburden, you're going to create an anaerobic environment for bacteria and then fungus and there goes your garden. Um, but it does have implications for the albedo as well. So you need to ensure that you are keeping your soils um, dark enough, light enough, and all of that is contingent on the composition. I'm not so much of a soils guy, that's, that's Carmen's stuff. So she's, she'll be talking about that in the PDC. And I reckon Michelle um, got a little something to say about the PDC, actually. I sure can. I think it's about an emission. It's more than an emission time. Can you believe you've been talking for 40 minutes already? I guess we no. started late, hey? Yeah, still. Um, I think, um, yeah, you know, I am going to just quickly chime in here about the PDC, because really that's the whole reason we're doing this uh, live series. We obviously want to deliver value and give you great information, but we're really excited about the upcoming online course. And Mitch is one of our instructors, one of a fantastic team. For more information, our website, birdpermaculture.ca forward slash online or online underscore PDC. I'll get Jen to paste it in the window and you can scroll. I'm just going to scroll really quickly through. I mean, we, for the online course, we charge 50% of what we do for the in-person course. So it's a really fantastic deal. And I feel like we deliver an incredible interactive um, program where you still get a uh, great ability to interact with your teachers and other classmates. But where was I going? Oh yeah, the teaching team. Cause uh, you just mentioned Carmen, she's our lead instructor. And of course, Rob and Dakota, if you watch our channel, you know, all these guys. And then our assistants, we've got Callista and Ben and Jen, who's on the chat window. And then our confirmed guest instructors. This is a huge team. We've pulled together, you know, the, uh, the best people we could think of to teach all these different sections. Alla, good friend, she's gonna be teaching community organizing. Tad is gonna be teaching marketing for hippies or marketing, I should say, for entrepreneurs. <laughs> Shauna is also gonna be teaching about community organizing. Barb is a permaculture teacher who actually um, lived on Bill Mollison's farm quite a few years ago, 30 years ago. Um, she doesn't do as much permaculture design course teaching, but uh, we're gonna pull her in for a couple guest sessions. And then Mitch, here you are Hello. on our website as well. All right, so just had to put another plug in for that. And I know you've got lots of slides left, Mitch. I gotta yeah. get it back to you. Yeah, I don't um, even think you'll get through them all. <laughs> I, frick. There's so much to talk about. I know. All right, I'm uh, chiming back out again. All right. And you can take back over. You know what to do. Um, are you you're screen sharing right now? I am, but I've lost. I've lost my. Um, you lost your Zoom window. I lost my Zoom window, and I got too many windows okay, I'll open. Just, and I can't I'll figure just... it out. <laughs> there we go. Yay! Okay, cool. So, uh, if you're just plugging in now, then write down where you're from. If you have any questions, I'll be answering those uh, eventually when I finish these slides, and. I'm going to try to try to skim skim through them and really dummy it down here. Um, alrighty, so yeah, just say hey, get engaged, ask questions, and I'll get to them when I'm done these slides. So we get back into water and microclimate. So earlier I was talking about latent heat and that phase change and why that is so important. So water has a super high specific heat capacity, which means it's really good for storing heat, and it is. Um, it presents itself with an amazing moderating effect because of that latent heat of vaporization or fusion, um, essentially that phase change. So when you have a body of water, 
a lot of that energy is going to go into evaporation, which is effectively going to cool your environment. And on the other hand, if you use condensation, you are going to release heat. And that's true for freezing as well, which is very counterintuitive, but it's, you know, physics is quite cool. And applying it to this is, is awesome. I'm, you know, I'm pretty, I'm nervous, but I'm also so excited to be here because this is basically my dream come true. So um, anyways, um, vegetation and animals have a lot to do with microclimate as well. So not only do animals release heat just as a function of their metabolism, but their yields should not be limited to just their poop and their meat. They give off methane and CO2 when they respire and poop. And we can use that because those are both greenhouse gases. So if you were to position your chicken coop close to your greenhouse, you could channel that gas into your greenhouse. So not only will your greenhouse benefit from that extra carbon dioxide, but it'll keep your greenhouse warmer as well. We can use vegetation as well. So we can use them for shading of buildings and open spaces. We can have roof gardens, which reduces the heat load on your buildings. You can change the direction of winds and buffer against those winds. You can even um, use different types of trees for different reasons. So say I was um, in this house right here and this was south facing right here. So the sun is where the mouse is. These deciduous trees, those leaves are gonna fall off in autumn, right when the sun angle is getting lower. So that sunlight will be able to penetrate more readily into my house. But in the summer, it's gonna be shade. So I'll effectively be cooling. And on a similar note, more built structures. So they have an effect on wind and they will reduce wind speed obviously by uh, reducing friction basically on the spot and they provide thermal mass. So I was went for a walk the other day just to get a sandwich on my lunch break and took this picture. Well, took this picture right here. So this is an example of thermal mass. So there's snow up here on the deck. There's snow right here. But right here, where it's hugging right here, there's no snow. And that's because this wall of rocks is thermal mass. So this is south facing as well. So Throughout the day, this is absorbing sunlight. That shortwave radiation is interacting with that medium, making the rocks, they don't look like they're vibrating, but trust me, on a molecular level, they're going and emitting long wave thermal radiation, which is inducing some snow melt right there. So when it comes to um, shelters and wind, we really wanna know where our wind is coming from. And there are a couple tools that we can use for that. One of those, and we'll, we're gonna go over way more comprehensive amounts of um, using nature as our um, historical weather record in the, in the full length PDC. But one tool you can use uh, in nature is just which way are those, are those trees flagging? I've been to some places um, in Stewart Island in New Zealand where there are trees that are just, they just shoot that way because the westerlies are so persistent right there. And if you have sufficient weather records around, you can create wind roses and you wanna have a long-term climatological record of this so you can actually have accurate and that will help you inform your design. So right here, this is a wind rose for Calgary, Alberta from the airport. And so it's pretty bimodal. We have, or trimodal almost here. So we have winds coming from North, Northwest right here, the West and the South. So that translates into some chilly Northeasterlies or nor Northerlies rather, not Northeasterlies, that's from this way, silly. Uh, some Chinook winds and I'll go in depth about Chinooks and what they are and how they happen in the full length PDC and these warm Southerlies. So that will help us. Um, and we'll get into this when we talk about windbreaks in just a little bit, that'll really help us inform our design. So when we go to apply our theory, um, we want to think about like, why are we doing this? And it's pretty crazy to think that people have been using and creating microclimates for, you know, time immemorial. And 
I really like this quote from Aeschylus. He's a Greek philosopher. And he says, though they had eyes to see, they saw no avail. They had ears, but understood not. But like shapes in dreams throughout their time, without purpose, they wrought all things in confusion. They lacked knowledge of houses, turned to face the sun, dwelling beneath the ground like swarming ants in sunless caves. And he was referring to the barbarians. And I wonder what he would be saying about how we are just using energy profusely to heat our houses and not, we're not using the most uh, abundant resource we have. And so when we're creating and finding microclimates, we need to get our goals in check. So we need to mitigate radiative losses, exclude or include solar radiation, enhance or degrade that solar radiation, enhance radiative heat storage and transfer, facilitate the drainage of cold air, offer shelter from the elements while still providing ventilation, we need to create a yield and we need to reduce energy usage from non-solar sources. So I wanna take a look at this plant hardiness zone map given by the government of Canada. And I wanna make you realize that this, these aren't the rules. And by listening to this, we are literally just putting limits on ourselves and what we can do. Um, so we are not gardening in hardiness zones, we are gardening in microclimates. And we're gonna get into some extreme examples at the end of this as to um, people who, who broke these rules. And so when, as we discussed earlier, we can work with aspect and slope, the light spectrum, thermal mass, evaporation and condensation, humidity, wind breaks, and all in the essence of creating and capturing heat. So right here is a passive solar house design. And it's very simple to, to understand this. So in the summer sun, it's gonna be, the, ang the sun angle is gonna be too high above to actually penetrate into these windows. So you're effectively limiting the amount of solar radiation coming in. So thereby you're keeping it cooler. In the winter, the sun angle allows sunlight to actually come in and interact with this thermal mass. So it's likely gonna have a low albedo, meaning that it's going to absorb that stuff and then it's gonna re-radiate it as long wave thermal energy. And quite recently, I had the chance of working on one of these projects. So this isn't a, um, a house per se, it's a greenhouse and this is at the Verge farm. And this right here is a north facing wall. No, I mean, south facing wall. Sometimes I get confused because I just moved from New Zealand this year. So I sometimes forget which way, uh, which way up is. Um, anyway, so right here where the mouse is, that is the south facing wall. And in the winter time, that sunlight is going to come right in here. I mean, it's a di absolutely a different shape. And there'll be, there's going to be a solar air collector right here. And that is gonna pump air, hot air, because it's gonna heat and naturally go from high to low. That's one of those base principles I was telling you about. It's always going to go from high to low and it's going to do so naturally and it's going to do so on its own. So it's going to get pumped to this manifold and then through all of this weeping tile out of this manifold right here. Just because it's colder over here and it's warmer over here and it's just going to whoop, it's going to push it all out. We cover that with a bunch of soil there's two layers of those. And throughout the winter time, we did some thermodynamic modeling on that. And it's looking like um, on, on average, and I know as a climatologist, you can't always just mess around with averages because um, taking the average of averages is not a very good thing to do because you don't incorporate those extreme heat or cold events that will have dire implications for you and your property. And we'll get more into that too during the PDC. Uh, but this just goes to show that through passive design, through clever design with just these principles, even no fossil fuels, we're able to extend our growing season for a couple months, which is fantastic in, in Canada. And there's, there are more ways that you can improve on this. So we could put a pond right here. And in doing so, we effectively have a high 
albedo surface right here because in the winter time it's going to freeze turn into ice and will reflect light and then that light will effectively double the amount of insulation coming into this this room this building and then assuming there's appropriate thermal mass that'll all get turned into heat that will radiate throughout the night and that'll cut down energy costs extensively. So on the note of incoming radiation, we need to consider where you are, your global context, because your climate dictates what you're going to do. And it, it dictates your limitations and your possibilities. And so it all, yeah, it all comes down to these global patterns of energy flow. So this greenhouse on the left there's not lots of direct sunlight, but that throughout the year, there's enough heat where you can use that sunlight by permitting it in at all angles by having only glazing that you can, that this will work. But in Canada, that's not going to work because all that heat is just going to, it's just going to leave. I mean, I wouldn't want to sleep in a glass house at night in Canada. That would be awful. Um, so yeah, in in Holland, if you have glazing on all sides, you're going to get a lots of indirect diffuse radiation. But on the right, this passive solar, there's a lot of light because um, there's a lot of high pressure and a lot of clear skies, especially in Alberta during the winter. But you need insulation because it's so cold. And that's really important to think, think about because in Alberta, an estimated 82% of greenhouses consume approximately... 5 million gigajoules of natural gas annually. So that equates to about 234,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide as a byproduct, which is crazy. And so we can also use this principle whereby um, heat rises and that, well, I guess this is what this whole section is about is heat rises and or hot air rises. And again, this is only going to work in some areas. Um, so let's say we're in the desert. It's 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So that it's going to be about ooh, um, 30, 32 degrees Celsius in the ambient air temperature. And so we have a solar air collector right here. And that's going to heat up this air right here. And it's going to rise. But it has to be infilled from somewhere. So assuming we have a closed system and this house is a closed system and we have an inlet right here, it's gonna draw that outside air in. And because the ground is 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which is um, about 11 degrees Celsius around there, then it's gonna cool that air down and go through the inlet Oops, in your house, which is effectively going to cool it. And same thing goes for water. Water is a fluid, just like air. And you can use these density principles to get hot water through your house. So this is just an evacuated tube, much that's in, much as like that's in um, solar water heaters. And we can use evaporation and condensation. We can use that latent heat of fusion and evaporation to our benefit. So a swamp cooler, essentially just uses a moist pad, it draws in hot air and causes or induces evaporation, which is causes cooling that goes through your house. You're effectively cooling your house, but you're also humidifying your house as well. So you want to incorporate that into where you are and those global circulation patterns that dictate if you would want to actually be adding more moisture into your building or your environment. Um, in the same scope, uh, ferneries would be in castles and they would effectively evaporate air through these wind tunnels, cooling it before it got in on these really hot days. And then condensation on the other hand, or in the same as freezing is it induces warming. And so you can apply that, like I said earlier for um, frost mitigation as they do for grapevines in New Zealand. We can use thermal mass to our advantage entirely. Um, so earth ships are great, but they're not appropriate for everywhere. And Rob will Rob can get into that more, but they are 
highlight the the concept of thermal mass. So they hold that heat. So they have a low albedo. So they're going to absorb that shortwave radiation and slowly convert it, not slowly convert it, but they're slowly going to release that as heat. And in, in the tropics, you need to have, um, you need, oh, that's actually the next slide, sorry. Um, so more thermal mass, we've got some bricks right here on this bottom middle garden bed right here. So at night, this is another way to make a buffer for your plants because that heat is gonna be slowly released throughout the day. And I like, the, I like the idea of having sort of checkerboard things. So right here, you're gonna, it's reflective because it's, it's not, let's say it's maybe an albedo of about 0.5, but you could mess around and have white ones and black ones so that some are gonna reflect light right back at your plants. So they're gonna get more sunlight. And then those darker ones, those are gonna radiate heat throughout the night. So you can not be too worried about frost. We talked about water being having um, a, spy, uh, a high specific heat capacity. So back here, there's these drums of water in black barrels. So the black, because it has a low albedo, is gonna absorb more of that sunlight. And then that water is going to retain and hold that heat and release it throughout the night. And down here, there's a pond and that does the same thing. So it just modulates those temperatures. So at nighttime, it's going to keep it warmer. And then in the daytime, it's going to keep it cooler. Some more examples of thermal mass and albedo. So in Greece, they have their buildings white and they through I uh, imagine centuries of observation and practice they used the this concept of albedo to their advantage so that the sun reflects off there but it's still it's still getting some some is being absorbed and they have their wall thickness perfectly planned out so that at nighttime the walls have just reached a temperature where it'll radiate throughout the, the night for an appropriate amount of time. And then by the time it's morning again, it'll be, it'll be done giving away its heat and then it's ready to absorb more. And the same thing's going on in this, in this greenhouse. So we've got white walls to reflect that light and then dark surfaces to absorb that light and that heat and re-radiate it through the night. We can use um, these water tubes as, um, in addition to thermal mass. So these water tubes are filled with water as the name may suggest, and they're red. And what happens with the red light filtering is it makes those plants more, in this case, tomatoes. Um, it gives them more of the light that they need to photosynthesize more efficiently. And that's just another way you can use, do some light tricks to your advantage. These, um, other plants over here, because they are white, they'll reflect more light to this other surrounding plants. And then this big, big drum we talked about earlier is just, it's black and it's gonna be full of water. So it's gonna be able to radiate heat more. Um, we're all pretty comfortable with the concept of shade. Um, so when you shade an area, you are thereby um, reducing the amount of insulation or the amount of sunlight that's coming in, in so you can reduce that interaction all across the board. And when it comes to wind and microclimate, so your wind is either your friend or it's your enemy. And that's because it transfers heat both to and from your property, depending on origin and those global circulation patterns on a larger scale. It happens on smaller scales too, like those um, density driven winds that we were talking about in the valleys. But it's important to consider because it stresses out your plants and it stresses out your animals. So what we do is we add wind breaks. And so when it comes to animals, they get really stressed out when it's super windy. So New Zealand sheep have a 15% reduction in weight in unsheltered fields and cattle don't eat as much when they're exposed. I know for one, I'm not in the habit of going out in 
my scabies and eating a sandwich in a really windy field, I'd rather be sheltered so I can relate. And some other benefits of windbreaks are they mitigate evaporative loss, they conserve soil, they add biomass. And um, I mean, I'm not a mycologist, but I imagine having more roots will enable more mycelium and more fungal interactions and create more edge. So it's not, the benefits aren't just for, for reducing wind stress. There's a lot of uh, positive externalities of having a windbreak. And so you can, um, you can orient them in certain ways and you want to make sure. Hey Mitch, the, we're at, we're at five, five. What's that? Sorry. I just want to point out 505. Do you think you can wrap up 10 minutes? Yep. We're, absolutely. we're at 505. Can you wrap up? Can you wrap up in 10 minutes? Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't, I only have uh, seven more slides, which I'll go through very quickly. Okay. Um, and we're going to get more into this, especially the windbreak stuff in the, the PDC in the full length one and how to effectively design those. And I'm just going to close off with um, some, some people who have, who've done, who've applied these to their own, to their own properties. So Sepp Holzer, he's an Austrian man. And even as a kid, he would, would garden in his, his family's backyard. And he started off with citrus trees and no one really thought that he'd be able to do so. So what he did was incorporated thermal mass and all of a sudden he was growing lemon trees in the um, mountains of Austria. And he would charge um, other kids to come see his lemon, tree, lemon trees with ice cream. And so the Russians have done this, and this is a little bit of a, I think, less well-known story, but oranges, lemons, mandarins, tangerines, grapefruits, limes, pomelos are the highest value fruit crops in terms of international trade, and they are not frost hardy. And convention would have us think that they can only be grown in tropical and subtropical locations. And in the 1950s, the Soviet Union, they had, they boasted 30,000 hectares of citrus plantations producing 200,000 tons of citrus fruit per year. And the three reasons as to how they were able to do that is because they bred citrus varieties that were more resistant to cold. And they did that by progressive cold hardening. So they would start south and then move north. And of course that would be opposite in the Southern hemisphere. They pruned them in a really radical way that made them more resistant to cold. So they constantly kept them pruned to one to two meters height because temperature variations and wind speed are smaller near the ground and they're easier to protect from the elements when they're smaller. Um, they also planted them in really unlikely locations. So trenches that were two meters deep and these walls right here, they had thermal mass and they were covered at night to prevent radiative losses. And that does it for me today. So those are my base principles for microclimate. So if you just checked in, um, First one, cold air is more dense than warm air. And alongside that is warmer air masses can hold more water vapor than colder air masses. An important thing to think about there is that relative humidity is a function of temperature. So um, warmer air masses, or let's say we have two air masses again. And I, I talked about this example at the very beginning. If you have two air masses, uh, they start at the same, same temperature, same water content. And you cool this one down, it's going to condense. And if you warm this one up, it's going to be able to hold more water because that relative humidity goes down. And we went over the zero, first and second laws of thermodynamics. And through that, um, the mechanism by which all of that plays out is through conduction, convection and radiation. And the third is that the world is always striving for a state of equilibrium, but because of the inputs um, that are always changing, that'll never happen. And the important thing to th consider when we're talking about this state of equilibrium and how the world is always striving for it is things will always move from high to low all on their own and respond accordingly to a shift in inputs. And the greater the difference between um, say medium A and medium B, the faster the flow is going to be from A to B. And the shorter the distance, 
between those, those mediums, again, the faster the flow. And this applies to landforms. I'll touch on that briefly in the PDC and especially with heat and pressure and humidity. And so I'd just like to close off with saying, when we're thinking about microclimates and what we need to think about is how can you best use that energy before it passes from your site or your system? Thank you. We're gonna get to some questions. And those are, where are those questions? Mitch, can you see the questions in the chat window? I am looking for them. I just can't find my Zoom window. It's probably because I'm sharing the screen. Yeah, my internet is not that stable. So if you can hear me, okay, I can read them out to you. And if we're having problems with my internet, it, what do you think? Um, I can I can see them, but... Um, Coming through. I actually couldn't hear you too well there. Um, yeah, that's what I said. My internet's unstable. Okay. Um, it looks like there's just a couple. Um, okay. Um, filler question. Okay. I've heard I shouldn't plant anything in a lower area as that's where the frost hits first. But there's a river near us and the lower area where I want to plant actually never frost because we get a lot of fog off the river. Can you explain this? Yep. So um, that fog is condensation. So that condensation, when it condenses, is actually giving off heat in the same way that when you go from a liquid to ice, heat's released. You're just going from, because it's, it's colder right there it, and that air is sinking, it's being a little bit buffered by that active condensation. So when that water, when that air parcel is like, oh, I can't, I can't hold on to this water anymore. I'm gonna let it condense. It's gonna release heat. So that may be why you're not experiencing the frosts um, that others may have told you to expect. What's the best material to create a warm microclimate for plants, brick, rocks, concrete, straw, et cetera? From Mark Wiley. Uh, well, I would say that the best one would be something, and it depends on what you have. So I would say, I would suggest using um, anything that has a low albedo and that will release heat really slowly. So it'll get really hot if you have a black drum filled with water because it's got such a low albedo, that black drum, it's gonna heat the water. And then at nighttime, when there's no energy being input in, it, that barrel of water, it's gonna to wanna to reach equilibrium. So it's gonna to wanna to release that heat. So it's gonna, but be, it's limited by how fast it can do that by the specific high specific heat capacity of water. So it's slowly gonna release into your environment. So I would, um, I would suggest just that. Um, the CO2 tend to move down slope, is it heavier than air? I know, um, I don't know. Um, and, sorry, Danny, I'm not too sure, but I'd be interested in that as well. So I'll look into that and um, I'll, um, I can talk about that in the, in the full length PDC. And, Edgar asks, could you combine a solar hot air collector and a inside brick wall to store that energy? Yeah, absolutely. So that's essentially what we did with the passive solar greenhouse. And could you, um, as long as it's, you're, you're channeling that hot air into that medium and it's gonna radiate out, of course, absolutely. Hey Mitch, uh, yep. I've seen this done um, an architect that we've worked with has designed, you know, brick walls in the middle of the house and directed the, the attic hot oh, yeah. air yeah. just with a little fan into a, into a brick wall yeah. and then the wall would radiate heat. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think I come through with better with my video off, don't I? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, and did you see, did you skip the question or did I miss that? There was any thoughts on using a compost pile as a heat source for I was, um, I, I wasn't sure if you said I can answer that last one. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll yeah, chime in on let, that one. Was so there was, a, there was a really great question about um, using compost pile as a heat source for a greenhouse, which isn't really a microclimate question, but 
Um, I just happen to know that, um, Danny, if you're looking for some of the best research that we've come across on this, in the 1970s, the New Alchemy Institute, and actually in general, if you're interested in greenhouses, try and dig up some of this research from the 1970s from the New Alchemy Institute. They've done some of the most comprehensive studies on heating greenhouses with compost. And they've got some plans and they've got um, how to do it and how they did it. The, the thing to watch out for is if you have um, a poor compost pile, if you're not composting properly, you could end up releasing ammonia, right? And that could damage your plants. So yes. yeah, there is potential there. And if you, if you want to dig into that, I personally find my greenhouse space is so valuable. I prefer to design it, design the, the building envelope to need as little energy as possible. And um, I don't want to give up any of my growing space for a compost pile in my greenhouse. So that's my two cents on that. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any advice on educational resources geared to young kids, as I feel this has been missing from traditional cur curriculum. Can you share how you got tapped into permaculture and any advice on post-secondary paths? Thank you. Well, uh, Sherry Lynn, um, I agree. Uh, that there are, there isn't enough resources geared towards this, especially with regards to growing food. Um, the The short answer is I'm not too sure, but I'm working on it. Um, that is what I want to do. Um, and I'll just say what, how I got started with my career in science was watching Bill Nye the Science Guy. And even even to this day, I find it incredibly helpful. Um, and it's all about applying these base principles into a, a creative way where you can get food as an output. Um, for me, I got really into um, weather and climatology. I, th I think it's because, I mean, I'm not 100% sure why anyone does everything they do, but everyone's got their little their little shticks. And for me, I recall asking my mom what was going on with these weather maps in the morning news. And I was like, I, I don't get it. Like what's, what's happening. And she tried to explain it to me and I didn't get it. And then when I went to university, um, my first introductory to weather and climate class, there, there, there were these weather maps again. I was like, I don't understand it. But for some reason, I really, really wanted to. And um, I wanted to apply that to food because um, as a climatologist, I'm very aware of what's going on with our climate. And it's scary, but there's no point in, in focusing on the problems and you need to focus on the solutions and how you're gonna use what you know to create solutions. So that's what I have made my goal in life. And permaculture is the means to do that for me because it is using these very basic natural phenomena to create a yield. And if, if you wanna talk more, reach out. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you more at length about this um, because it is important for, for kids and for people to, to know more about this. So I'm happy to, to have a chat with you about that. And you can, you can contact me at mitch at vergepermaculture.ca. Okay, Mitch, thank you. That was fantastic. And um, we're gonna keep going with these live sessions, right? These live oh, yeah. introduction to permaculture. Do you know uh, Thursday? So the next one is Sunday night. Yep, Sunday night, what Sunday, do, Tuesday, Thursday. Who's, who's our guest speaker for Sunday? Who knows? Jen? I have no do idea. You know? I don't know who it is either. <laughs> It'll be somebody fantastic from our teaching team. <laughs> And um, we want to thank all of you for joining us. My, I'm sorry, my internet's so unstable. So my videos kind of uh, going on and off. But um, thanks, everybody. We yeah, hope to see you again on Sunday or next Tuesday or next Thursday. And yeah, I think Sunday's everyone. Dakota, by the way. Oh, great. Livestock, I think. Yeah, it'll be gardening with livestock then. Yeah, that is a fantastic session. Um, if you have livestock or you're looking to incorporate them into your permaculture design, you don't want to miss our Sunday session then. And again, check out our website. Um, we'll only be offering this course once a year. And this is our, this is our small little marketing push window to um, find the people who might be the right fit for this program. So 
Anyhow. You're gonna learn a lot and it'll, mm-hmm. it'll change your life. I mean, yeah, there's no traditional curriculum. So this is the, this is the, this is where you learn this stuff. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Have a great yeah. night. Bye. Thank you everyone.